In this video, I'm looking at an old Japanese patent application for a microlithography stepper lens submitted by Nikon in 1998. It's a purely dioptric ultraviolet lens. In the years since, other methods have emerged, such as, for example, laser scanning with an F-theta lens and using diffractive optics. But understanding and conceiving of new lens designs is a lot easier if you already understand prior designs. So let's look at this very complex lens system. This is a 29 element reduction projection lens. This type of lens is usually referred to as a stepper lens because of its use in step lithography. As the 1990s proceeded, step and scan became the dominant method for large scale IC production. And this exact lens was designed by Nikon for use in step and scan photolithography. These are not small lenses. The stepper lens described in this patent is more than a meter long. It appears that the human standing next to the lens in this picture is holding a cassette of wafers. The lens in this patent illuminates at most 3 centimeters on the wafer. But with the stepping motion of the wafer, multiple copies of the image are transferred onto a large wafer. The scanning is illustrated in one of the patent drawings. It's done differently in this description than was shown in that animated GIF that I started out with. Light from the illumination system is swept across the reticle with a maximum range of about 100 millimeters. In turn, a focused beam sweeps across the wafer with a maximum range of about 25 millimeters. A smaller range is defined by blocking light with a slit. After rastering the exposed area, the wafer is moved over to begin exposing a new area. Moving the wafer over is what is referred to as stepping. It's probably obvious to you that the lens in the picture is in the likeness of the part that is shown here in red. Besides being ultra high resolution, the design needs to be two-sided telecentric in order to maintain uniform recording conditions over the entire image field. The features on the reticle are small, but the circuit needs to be even smaller. 0.1 to unity is a typical range of magnification for stepper lenses. As is usually the case with two-sided telecentricity, the first lens surface is quite large, permitting then a large object size that matches the clear aperture of the first refracting surface. The design is driven by the need to eliminate any field curvature. In fact, you'll be able to see from just inspecting the ray diagram how the image field is flattened. And of course, distortion should be undetectable on the scale of an integrated circuit. If you design to a 100 nanometer gate, you want a 100 nanometer gate. Distortion in this context would mean that the gate length at the edge of the field is inaccurate. The Rayleigh criterion would have that the smallest resolvable detail on the image is 0.61 times the wavelength divided by the image side numerical aperture. But there's no law of physics dictating what resolution actually is and considerable effort has been devoted to engineering systems that tolerate a smaller factor in front of the ratio of lambda over numerical aperture. The K1 process factor, as it's called, is a collection of everything else that can be done in the lithography process to enhance resolution. Sub-vacuum wavelength resolution is achieved by reducing K1 and increasing numerical aperture. Using resolution enhancement techniques, such as high index material, solid immersion, and polarization illumination, K1 equal to 0.3 is achieved along with a numerical aperture of 1.55 and a 37 nanometer half pitch. And with up-to-date two-pass lithography, or rather pitch division, this K1 becomes 0.15. But for the late 1990s invention that I'm describing today, a likely value for K1 was 0.45 or even 0.5. The lens was designed for an air-filled numerical aperture of 0.68 and operated at the wavelength of a krypton fluoride excimer laser, giving a value of 164 nanometers for the half pitch, or rather for the resolution. Scanning further increases the total transmitted information. I could get a sense of what this means by rearranging the resolution expression, putting everything on the left side. Now suppose that the image is twice as large as the resolution meaning that the area of the image is four times larger than the area that can be resolved. The amount of information transferred is thus four times larger, and then with an added factor just called S for the compounding effect of scanning. So replace the R in this expression with the image height, and you get an idea of the amount of information that is being transferred by the light passing through the reticle and onto the wafer. 
I won't use numbers with this. I just want to make the point that from an information theory perspective, larger numerical aperture, shorter wavelength, and smaller K1 factor make photolithography more efficient at transferring image details for a given image size. So here are the 29 fused silica lens elements. There is a hard aperture between the 21st and 22nd elements. The reticle or object is marked with an R on the left and the wafer or image is marked with a W on the right. I wanted to trace some rays through this and compute some optical quantities, but my ZMAX license had already expired while working on the previous patent study, so I needed to write some homemade code to do that for me. I'll look at an axial ray pencil in green and a ray pencil from the edge of the object in red. Don't strain your eyes here, but this is the lens prescription from the patent application. There are columns of radius of curvature and surface thickness. My MATLAB code works from an Excel file containing this information. You might notice that my surface numbers are shifted by 1 because most program languages don't care to start indexing with 0. The first surface is the image. The stop flag column is used to indicate the stop surface. All of the entries are zero except the stop surface, which is set to one. As all of the lens elements were made from the same material, there are no joined achromats. It was not clear to me if the space between the lenses is air or vacuum. Although this is quite a relaxed design, there's sensitivity to the refractive index in these spaces. I used air between the lens elements and assumed vacuum between the last element and the wafer. Maybe it should just be air everywhere. Anyway, the choice of airspace refractive index does matter for the precision required here, and this type of design cannot be finalized without its consideration. The Abe number in D light isn't relevant, so I just put infinity, which results in a monochromatic analysis at the design wavelength of 248.4 nanometers. The vertical lines in the ray trace are the vertex locations for each surface. With this many elements, that just might be a little too difficult to make sense of, so let's overlay the lens from the patent application. Fortunately, this patent drawing was prepared to scale, so it matches nicely with my vertical lines. This stepper lens is divided into six groups of elements. The effective power of the front five groups alternates between positive and negative, with the front group being net positive. Notice that the very first element is negative. This is deliberate in order to expand the beam so that the rest of the first group can make a stronger contribution to the system power. The second group is net negative for the same reason that the first lens is negative. The expanded rays coming out of the second group enter the third group diverging. That divergence is then turned back into a focusing direction. Notice how the rays are farther away from the optical axis in this third group. A lens bends a ray more when the ray is farther from the optical axis. This helps to keep the image location close to the lens. The fourth group pushes the rays back away from the optical axis, and the fifth positive group focuses them back again for a positive effective focal length. The final element adjusts the final focus location, and it could be positive or negative depending on where the image surface needs to be. The bulges and constrictions that you see as the ray pencil proceeds from the object to the image are no accident. This lens design is driven by the need to keep the pets fall sum close to zero. Doing this demands a combination of negative and positive refracting powers. A useful trick to get the pets fall sum to zero is to use a lower index glass for the negative elements. But the lens elements in this patent are all made from the same type of material, silica. So to eliminate Petzval is necessary to include the exact same amounts of positive and negative powers. Each surface contribution to the Petzval sum depends only on the surface power and the refractive index. It does not depend on ray height. But the influence of a surface on the image location most certainly does depend on ray height. If rays strike a surface farther from the optical axis, then that surface has more influence on the image location. So the ray heights at the negative elements are lower than the ray heights at the positive elements, ensuring that there's a small but positive image distance while simultaneously minimizing the Petzval sum. So now let me take you through the output file of my homemade ray tracing code and show you what can be learned about this patent embodiment. Before anything else happens in the program, a ray is traced from the aperture stop to the source. This is done in order to determine the chief ray launch angle. Because the lens was designed to be telecentric, the launch angle is, in principle, zero. It's launched at negative 0.2 degrees, which is pretty close to zero. 
I might attempt to get closer to zero in optimization, something my homemade code doesn't do. Two-sided telecentricity also requires zero chief ray angle at the image. At minus 0.2 degrees on the object side and minus 1 degree on the image side is pretty close to telecentric. I suppose there will be a customer specification that sets what this needs to be smaller than. So right away, I find that the patent embodiment replicates one desired property, telecentricity. Let's check out more, like the location of the image, or rather the back image distance, BID. I calculate 23.87 millimeters. The lens prescription in the patent suggests 22.179 millimeters. The total track length, defined in the program as the distance from the first lens element to the image, is 1,154 millimeters. Track length in this type of invention, though, is measured from the object image, or rather the conjugate distance. Accounting for the 96 millimeter object distance results in a conjugate distance of 1,250 different from the published value of 1,248 millimeters only by that discrepancy in the back image distance. The effective focal length is positive 1,617 millimeters. This, along with the back focal length, really aren't very meaningful when the goal is to be afocal, which is probably why the patent description didn't indicate them. In ideal telecentricity, an incoming chief ray is parallel and then is also parallel coming out. Here, an incoming parallel ray is not quite the chief ray and it also does not emerge perfectly parallel. Because effective focal length is larger than total track length, this lens maintains a telephoto focus, putting the rear principal plane in front of the lens and making a negative back focal distance possible. The telephoto condition applied to a very long track length is kind of a recipe for two-sided telecentricity. For a telecentric lens, the image space F number is undefined, ideally it's infinity. So the working F number is used with the telecentric condition and this lens has a working F number of 0.538. Yeah, you heard me right, it's small, maybe smaller than you thought possible. Aberrations should be out of control huge at this small of a working F number, but with 58 surfaces, a stop, and the object distance, there are 118 degrees of freedom, making it possible to keep aberrations low. Numerical aperture is the commonly used figure of merit. This is the sine of the image space marginal ray angle times the image space refractive index. 0.68 is huge for an air-filled image space. And no surprise that this agrees with the patent description as it derives from the lens geometry and the user-defined entrance pupil diameter, which I will come back to. The program determines the necessary radius of the aperture stop. This is simply the height of the marginal ray at the coordinate of the stop. The patent description suggests a somewhat different value, 124 millimeter radius. When running this code, the user is asked to enter an entrance pupil diameter. Because they are essentially the same thing, the aperture radius and numerical aperture will depend on the choice of entrance pupil. I entered a value that yielded the numerical aperture that was provided with the patent, but that numerical aperture doesn't quite coincide with the stop size cited here. However, when vacuum is assumed between all the lenses, the stop radius is closer to the value in the patent table at about 150 millimeters. The praxial image height is the radius of the area on the wafer that is exposed to light. Using the object size that was included with the patent description, we get 13.2 millimeters. That it agrees with the image size listed in the patent could only happen if the magnification that the code calculates is the same as the magnification in the patent. And for sure, the code gives a magnification of 0.25, negative because the image is upside down. So I provided an entrance pupil diameter of 7,000 millimeters. In principle, it should be infinity for a telecentric lens, but this isn't ideally telecentric. So it's just very large. I knew to use 7,000 because it resulted in the numerical aperture of 0.68. Also, the field of view should be zero, and it's pretty close to zero at 0.2 degrees. Around the year 2000, when this patent application was filed and the Pentium 4 was coming out, the industry resolution was about 140 nanometers. The diffraction limit of this design is close to that. Remember, we found using a typical process factor from that era that the resolution should be about 164 nanometers. Perhaps it's no accident that the geometry set forth in this design delivers an area radius of that same value. 
A flat image surface will have infinite Petzval radius and no astigmatism. At more than half a kilometer, the Petzval surface is pretty flat. But is this flat enough? The Petzval sag might be a more useful quantity. This tells you how far the image lifts away from the flat image plane at the outer edge. Using this Petzval radius, the location of the image out at the edge due to the Petzval field curvature is 183 nanometers in front of the surface of the wafer. I think it's the customer's call if that's acceptable. A real nail biter in this design is how close does the distortion come to zero? Very close. I'm not sure that I can calculate a distortion this small with much confidence. In fact, the distortion published with the patent application is also unimaginably small, just not the same unimaginably small as my value. I've benchmarked the software against ZMAX results, so I do have confidence that I'm agreeing with that. But what's the uncertainty of zero? And this brings me to third order aberration and the Seidel coefficients. At large numerical aperture, polarization aberration becomes important, but here I'm just looking at the Seidel terms. As Seidel coefficients go, they're quite small, beginning with the spherical aberration, indicating that this is a well-optimized design. The purpose of so many elements is to relax the design and keep the angle of incidence at each surface as small as possible. The largest wavefront aberration coefficient is that of coma, if coma can't be further minimized, it could have the effect of reducing the usable field, which may not be acceptable for a step-and-scan photolithography system. Minimizing astigmatism tends to go along with minimizing coma, and doing so is necessary to keep the image surface flat in both the tangential and the sagittal. We've already checked that Petzval field curvature and distortion are remarkably small. The distortion coefficient is positive, consistent with the telephoto focus. An interesting observation can be made concerning the last surface, line 60. For each aberration, this surface makes a very large contribution, orders of magnitude larger than the total. You can see the large angle of incidence each ray makes with this surface. The rays are extremely aberrated as they reach this final surface, and the aberration is then corrected to these small values single-handedly by the last surface. So at least in this design, I might refer to the final element as an aberration corrector. Stepper lenses can weigh more than 1,000 kilograms. An important optomechanical consideration is deformation of the heavy glass elements coming from mounting stresses. In order to tackle the optomechanically induced trefoil, which is triangular astigmatism brought on by three-point mounting, Around 1999, Nikon switched from using three-point mounts, which allow the lens to deform under its own weight, to kinematic mounts, which constrains all six degrees of freedom without introducing any additional constraints, resulting in deformation-free mounting. It isn't clear which mounting approach was used when prototyping this invention. Given the time frame, perhaps it could have been either one. Generally speaking, the optical design of a stepper lens has tight tolerances for the alignment in the range of submicrons and arc seconds. I hope that this was a useful patent study for you. Thanks for watching.